Hello Life Changes Church, we are so excited that you clicked on this video. We are in a series called What's It Like? As we look at the parables that Jesus told as he unpacked the kingdom of God for us. So why don't you get ready, sit back, grab a notebook, grab a pen as we get encouraged by this word. I really do love this church. I love Life Changes. I love Life Changes Century City because of people like the Pringles, as Brett mentioned, uh, like people because of somebody I saw last week uh, called Shirley Pearson. And I just want to take a quick moment because Shirley has been a part of the church for a number of years and yet just keeps pivoting and changing and serving in different areas. And, her, and her incredible daughter, Tamron, has added such life. But Shirley, I want to honor you because I was leading worship early uh, for the first time in a long time. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I see Shirley arrive early and she's one of the site captains here that makes Sundays happen and work, and I just want to say, it just it filled my heart with such faith, just seeing you coming and just shouting to at people, telling them what to do, <laughs> but, but it was filled with such passion for the local church. I want to say thank you, Shirley. You, seeing people like you just put, makes me want to serve God more and serve His bride more, so thank you. It means, means the world to me and to us, so we love you lots, Shirley, really are, and I know that every sacrifice, God says He will not be mocked. You'll reap what you sow, and we are trusting that for your family in, in the totality of it. So we love you lots. Um, I love this church. I love Shirley Pearson, <laughs> but I also love my wife, Fiona, and I know she's in the mom's room right now uh, or ran outside with our little man, and uh, I want to tell you that I am in love with her. So I just uh, get, get the microphone so I get to do this every now and again. I love my wife, people. So here we go. And, um, and I, I met her, and, we, and I've told the story many times, but I'll tell it again. I met her, and I fell head over heels in love with her from the first sight. No jokes. I saw her, and I fell in love. But she did not. <laughs> but I remember that moment when, when I realized that actually the, the, the feelings weren't mutual initially. They weren't reciprocated. I just suddenly said, no, Gabe, it's, it's not the end of the world. We'll, we'll just pivot, and we'll keep going. And then I remember asking her out on the 20th of April. She said yes initially. A couple of hours later, phoned me and said, actually, can I retract that? I don't feel confident. And she said no. And at that moment, I said, Gabe, not the end of the world. Not the end of the world. Pivot, pivot, pivot. And I just, I operated into my lawyer mode and I was able to help her see why dating me was optimal for her future plan in life. And we're able to transition that moment. And I, I remember the first time, I think it was in about the May, a little maybe premature, about a month of dating, I said to her, Fiona, I love you. To which she responded, thank you. <laughs> True story. Again, I sucked it up and I said, Gabe, not the end of the world, not the end of the world. We'll just pivot, we'll just keep going, we'll just keep going. It's not the end of the world, Gabe, we can, we can make this work. I remember taking her to meet my mom and dad for the first time. I remember in a church service like this, worshiping, and she with her hands lifted up, worshiping. My mom elbowed me and said, that is God's gift of grace to you. And I said, amen, mom, amen. I knew it, I, I knew it, but I, I, those words just have gone deep in my heart as I've actually known that this is not just... A girl, this is my girl that God has given to me to treasure, and I, and, I, and I absolutely love her. And then I remember wanting to buy a ring and getting a ring, but I didn't have quite enough money to get it the way I wanted, but I thought, not the end of the world, not the end of the world. We'll pivot, we'll beg, borrow, steal, we'll do what we need to get to get the ring that is, that is due this amazing girl. And then I remember the fact that uh, I couldn't meet her dad because her dad was uh, up country and, uh, and unreachable because he was in a place where there was no phone signal. And I was desperate because I, I wanted to pop the question, but he, I couldn't get hold of her dad. But I thought, not a big deal, not a big deal. We'll just start planning the, the wedding on the sly as if he said yes in faith. And we'll just make this thing work. Not, a, not the end of the world, you know. We'll just keep going. And I remember then the ring was delayed. And Fiona was getting a bit anxious and a bit, uh, every time we'd go out, she was expecting, is this the moment? And it wasn't the moment. And not the end of the world, not the end of the world. We'll get there, we'll get there. And then I remember I had a date in mind. I, had, I was going to propose and I was so ready. And this was the beginning of November, 2013. And then I just remember this moment, as I, this conversation, as I was getting, the, my affections were growing for Fiona, my, my anticipation to make her my wife, the expectation of what it will be like, the, the obsession of Fiona. And I'll be honest, my obsession for her was, was quite crazy. Thank God I married her, because otherwise I would have been one of those famous ex-stalkers, those guys. You know? It was on those levels, but I was obsessed with this lady. And then I remember this conversation where oh, I had this plan. I was about to propose a couple weeks out. I had the plan of the wedding. And then Fiona said to me one day, sitting in the sun, she said, you know what I want to do next year? And I said, what do you want to do, love? She said, I think I'm going to go start a, a new degree at UCT and move in with my friend Sarah there for the year. 
I looked at her, and I remember in that moment, I thought, end of the world. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. I said, no, 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 no. And I remember they were getting very feisty in the moment, saying, what do you think this has all been leading up to? This is not a pivot for you to go start another life somewhere else. No, there is an agenda here, and there is a passion in my heart to make you my wife. But obviously, because of this moment, it was because the thing was delayed, and things weren't working out in the timing. And then two weeks later, I just, we had to bring the timeline closer, and I got down on one knee in, in one romantic se- uh, setting, and she said, and I quote, heck yes, when I asked her to be my wife. And her plans had to very pivot and change in that moment. And I remember this incredible reality as my affection, my expectation, my anticipation, my obsession for grew and grew and grew until it came to a climax on the 22nd of February 2014 when I said I do, she said I do, and we became husband and wife. And as they say, the rest is history. Now I want to say just uh, one more time, just in case she can't hear me. I love you, Fiona. I really do. I really do love Fiona Francis Phillips, but as I have been thinking about this and marinating in our, in our love story, that means so much to us, maybe it means very little to you, but I want to tell you, as I read the Bible, I'm more and more convinced that the narrative, the meta-narrative of the Bible, you can read it in a number of different ways, you can read it in different lenses, but I believe that the Bible is articulating a love affair. A love affair, inviting humanity into a love affair with Almighty God. Humanity for for us human beings to engage with our Almighty God, but not as subjects far off, but actually as intimate participators in this relationship with Him. Now, I want to tell you, this is, how do I get this? Well, let me tell you, it's all through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. It's, page one starts with God over Adam, and almost the first face he sees is God breathing life. In a sense, it's the kiss of life. It starts with a kiss. Revelations chapter, the very end, chapter 20, 22, ends with a wedding as Jesus comes back to consummate all this thing. It starts with a kiss. It's this romantic love affair. ends in a wedding, and has this incredible, beautiful invitation to intimacy with him. But as the prophetic writers, the killers, once said, it started out with a kiss. How did it end up like this? How did it end up so dry? How did it end up so boring? So, uh, matter of fact, that we're in and out and we feel nervous and actually we've lost the very essence of what God was, had designed for humanity and himself. And then Jesus comes on the scene. He starts to tell parables about what the kingdom of God is like, what the kingdom of God will be like. And it's incredible. He, there's so many different metaphors he uses and there's different metaphors that he could have used that he didn't use. But a metaphor that we see to pop up again and again in different shape and forms is this idea of a feast or this idea of a wedding, a banquet, a wedding banquet, a feast. The kingdom of God is like a wedding feast. And I want to tell you today, we're going to dive into one of those. Matthew chapter 25 is one of three final parables, one after each other, that Jesus tells about the end of the world. So I want to tell you the title of my sermon that will get all of the conspiracy theorists' hearts racing right now. The title of my sermon is, It's the End of the World. (laughs) So why don't you turn to the person next to you, and if you're feeling very uh, on key today, why don't we sing a little bit of REM to each other. One, two, three. It's the end of the world, and we know it. (laughs) You don't have to carry on if you want. We can. And I feel fine. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's read the Bible together. This is church. People, welcome to church. Nice to see you. Give me one more wave. There we go. Good, good, good. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven, Jesus preaching says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids. Other translations say 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil, olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were aroused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. 
So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day nor the hour of my return. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God. Would you, by the power of your word and your spirit, awaken us? Would you light the flame? I pray, Father, would you stir us out of our slumber? Pray that we'll never be the same. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus, come. We welcome you here, Jesus. Amen, amen. I want us to understand something that this narrative might seem so foreign, might seem different, might seem we, uh, may, archaic in language, and we're trying to make sense of it from our, our perspective. We have to understand that a Jewish audience would have understood a lot of the, the analogies that Jesus was using like this. He was using things that, and metaphors that were easily accessible to him. So I want us to understand the Jewish cultural understanding of how the bridal process of a husband proposing to a wife and making known his affection, his anticipation, his expectation, his obsession on this girl that has grabbed his heart, how that would play out. And this was the backdrop of this parable, is that understanding briefly is a husband would come, or a husband-to-be, a man would come, and he would come to the father of the bride and the bride, and he would come to her and to, in a sense, to make sure, put down, to propose, to, to uh, be betrothed together, he would pay a price, an upfront price, a labola. And he, all, my, all my African friends say, hey, oh, that's us. They understand this reality. Our Western culture doesn't understand this, but to pay a price because saying, actually, she is worth something. She is worth something, and I'm going to pay something down, a deposit upon her life because I'm coming for her. And then secondly, what would happen there to, to seal this moment between the bridegroom-to-be, the man, and the, the bride's father, they would sit and they will drink a cup of agreement together. They'll drink some wine. they pour some wine there, get the, no, no tussies here, get the Malo, you know, just in the, cab, the cab salve, you know, and put it out there. They'll sit and, mm, go and smell the tannins, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll drink this cup of agreement that actually the price has been paid, that actually this has been, this is a deal. So that secures that the father then can't go on the sly and sell it to the higher, another higher bidder. He's saying, yes, this is happening. You're going to marry this girl. So the next incredible reality in that moment, the cup was shared to show that there was a willingness to sacrifice in order to have his bride, but also the bride's family willingness for her to enter into this marriage. And then pay the cost, and then the groom would depart, and he would say something like this. He would say, this is the groom's job. The groom would say, I'm leaving now after I paid the price, drunk the cup with the father. He says, I am going to go and prepare a place for you. And he would leave, and he would go and prepare a place for his bride-to-be. And he would go to his father's house, and he will start to build upon his father's house like, a, on, like a, a, the eastern wing, you know, a bridal chamber. If, depending on the, the size of his money, it would be, even could become described as a mansion, a mansion on the side of his father's house. And this could take up to a year. This was no shortcut process. Now, this guy could have had passion for his wife, so he would be ready. He was eager. He was, affections were going. His expectations, anticipation, obsession was growing. He was so keen to go and seal the deal with his wife and make her his wife. That's why he didn't set the timings of this process. Because the father, his father didn't want him to shortchange the, the building construction of this, this, this mansion for his bride. So what would happen was that the father of the groom would be the one who would tell him that when he's ready to go back to fetch his bride. He would expect this thing. It would be under the eye of the father. And in a sense, friends would come to him and say, hey, buddy, when are you going to bring your wife back? I see you building. It looks like it's near completion. When are you going to go get her and bring her home? And he'll say, only my father knows that time. Not me. Not me. This is the amazing reality. Is then what would be happen in this process, the bride all along would be waiting. Affections growing. Expectation. Anticipation. Obsession with what it'll be like when he comes for her. And in a sense, though, she was never doubting his return. Why? Because he had paid such a high price already. He had paid such a high price. He's coming back for me. There's no worrying, no looking at anxiety at the clock going, I think, I, I think he's got cold feet. No, no, no. He's paid. He's drank the cup. He's coming back. So she'll be waiting. In a sense, the colloquial words, when they'll see the, a bride in waiting, people would say that other guys would come and go, oh, she's nice. And people would go, no, no, buddy. She's spoken for. The words they'll use say, she's, she's already set apart. She's set apart for another. She's been bought with a price, they'll say. 
That was the language they would use about this lady to deter other suitors or other people who got maybe a bit excited in the waiting. But what would happen was, not just the bride, bride would wait with other bridesmaids or other uh, virgins, other friends, sisters and friends who are unmarried and would be waiting, and they'll be waiting with her to help make sure that she's ready whenever the groom came. Their job was make sure the bride is ready when the groom comes. You don't know when he's coming, but when he comes, she must be ready. The curlers can't be in the hair. The makeup needs to be done. You can't be just like sleep out of your eyes. You need to be ready for when he comes. And that's why often the, the language there we see in the scripture there was that the lamps were ready because his arrival could be at any moment. And actually, it was a romantic notion if your groom would come in the middle of the night because there was a stir. People weren't at work. This was just not, people wouldn't be, going, wouldn't be missing on jobs. Everyone would be in the city. Everyone would be around the homes. And everyone would know there'll be the cry, He's coming! And homes, doo -doo, lights would start going. Lamps would be lit. The curlers would be taken out. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And they'll have to prepare because the, bride, the, the groom is coming for his bride. It's been ages. He's been, his obsession, he's been affection. His affection's growing. Expectation, anticipation. I'm coming back to get her. And people would be so excited. This moment, there'll be this shout of warning. And then there's this, the lamps would be lit. And then there'll be joyous celebrations as they led the way to his father's house for the consummation of this marriage and the wedding feast to make this whole process complete. Just this beautiful picture of what it was like in those days. So when Jesus said, the kingdom of God will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom, the people listening had an idea what Jesus was talking. They had an understanding of what he was speaking about, but it was shocking. It was shocking. Why? Because he says, this is the reality. They said, when the bridegroom was delayed... They all became drowsy and fell asleep. I can imagine as Jesus was telling the story, the master teacher, oh, Rabboni, the incredible teacher who got them and he's telling this narrative they're all familiar with. Then he, they're like, yes, yes, tell us about this incredible romantic thing happening. He says, but they all were drowsy and fell asleep. I can imagine the audience would have gone, and I quote, Haibo. That's Jewish for, no, I'm just joking. But they were like, Haibo wena. Whoa, that is crazy. How, what do you mean? She fell asleep. They were drowsy and fell asleep. And today, I want to, before we pull this parable apart, I want to tell you, when I've been thinking the last few weeks about the church, and there's so many different metaphors you can talk about the church, but if you can describe the church now, well, around the world, I think the one word that comes to mind is that she is a sleeping bride. She is a sleepy church. You see, there's the signs of the times that talk about the end of the world the chapter before this parable starts, Jesus is explicitly teaching about the end of the world. He says, this is what is coming. And he says, there'll be the signs of the time. Do you guys want to know what the signs of the time are? He says, he says you'll hear war, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be earthquakes, there'll be famines. And he says, but, that does, but don't be worried, that does not mean the end has come yet. He says, this reality, he says, this is another sign. He says, sin will abound and the love of many will grow cold. The sign of the end times is that the love of many will grow cold. And that's not saying the love of those who never had any love. No, no. For your love to grow cold means you once had a love. Those who once proclaimed, once declared, their hearts have become drowsy and fell asleep. This is what Jesus says um, when he, in the book of Revelations when the angel comes to the different churches. He comes to the church in Ephesus and he commends the church in Ephesus for all these different things they did. You did wonderful things like this. You had wonderful programs, wonderful services. And, and, I, it's a, and I open this up a little bit, but this is this indictment about them. He says this, I have this against you. You have forgotten your first love. And I can imagine as that is preached as they come, it's almost you can hear the church in Ephesus go, it's not the end of the world. Have you not seen our services? Have you not seen what we're doing? Have you not seen all our stuff for the poor? It's not the end of the world. Come on, come on, don't be so over the top. It's not the end of the world. I mean, this, the next church comes up, the church in Laodicea in Revelations 3, the, 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 the accusation against it says, you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm. So he says, so I spit you out my mouth. It's like this, wow, that's aggressive. Like, whoa, whoa, calm down, buddy. It's not the end of the world. Don't come tell us about spitting out stuff. This is church on a Sunday. Calm down. It's not the end of the world. 
Uh, you know what, and the reality I've realized in my own heart is that actually when our hearts are going to become cold, if you want to know how does my heart get cold, how does somebody who once loved Jesus with everything, a growing obsession, a growing affection, a growing expectation, a growing anticipation, how does it grow cold? One thing I believe the Bible teaches us is that hearts that are no longer convicted of sin. Hearts that are no longer convicted of sin. You see, and that goes all around the world, but also finds its place here. We've started defining sin by our culture and not defining it by a holy God. What is acceptable in culture? What is the, uh, okay in culture? And we start, let's re, we got to just reimagine what God thinks about sin. God hasn't changed his mind on sin, but we have. And our hearts grow cold. You see, this is the sort of reality. Uh, a few nights ago, we've got a, an amazing little girl called Olivia. She is like the epitome of well-behaved, kind, gentle, loving. She is the antithesis of her brother Benji. He is hurricane. She is just grace. She is peace and grace personified. But she has gotten a bad habit of not sleeping well the last few nights. The last few weeks, this last couple of weeks, she's woken up several times in the night, and, and it's like just every couple of hours she, she wakes up, and I'm just like, oh, you're joking. And she's like tapping me on the, it's like, Dad, what now? And it's like, yeah, I, I need to go to the loo. Okay, I'll go with it then. Dad, I'm feeling itchy. I need cream. Oh, my gosh. Dad, I'm not comfortable in my bed. I'm just like, you're joking. And this beautiful girl who's not a naughty girl, she's not a bad girl, but I'll confess to you, that I start getting irritated. The third, fourth time at three in the morning, I, my, I've now, I'm, out, I'm done. And it's as if I'm dealing with the most reprobate sinner of all humanity. I'm confessing here. Because the other night, she came for the fourth time, Dad, I need, and I lost it. And I'm, not, I'm very ashamed to say I lost it. And I shouted at her, and I was rough. And I, I said, didn't go to the toilet, and I shouted. And, and, I, and, and this, this beautiful little girl, I put it back into bed, and then I left her, and I said, I, Sleep now, I'm done. And I walk through back to my bed, and I hear just gentle sobbing there. And I get into bed, and I go, I'm just, you know, I'm justified to this. I'm justified because she's woken up four times. And I get into bed, and I pull the covers up, and I'm going, I'm going to sleep because I'm so tired now. And then I lie there, and I just hear that gentle crying in from a room. And I'm, I just feel in that moment, just absolute grief hit my heart, saying, What have I done? And I'm like, No, I just got to sleep. I'm tired. And I try, and I try, and I try, but I just cannot sleep. <sighs> Out of bed. Go to Liv's, and I get next to her, and I lie down next to her, and she's still there, little wiping little tears away, and I say, Liv's, and I start to cry, and I say, Liv's, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Can you forgive me? She puts her little hand on my face, and starts rubbing my, little, my, my equivalent of her beard. <laughs> and she says, it's okay, Dad. She says, I forgive you, Dad. And I, I'm like, I'm undone. But something that hit me in that moment is that I think the, what I was, actually, it, it hurt me that I, the way I was with her, but I started to realize how often do I grieve the Holy Spirit and just turn back over and go back to sleep and nothing changes me. My heart has got hard towards sin, convicted of sin. That's not that big a deal. It's not the end of the world. I'll say again and again. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. We, we say it. It's, you know, everyone does. It's just a little bit of lust. It's just a little bit of greed. It's just a little bit of, of licentiousness, a little bit of anger that's unrestrained. It's, just, it's not the end of the world. It's normal for people to react like this. It's not the end of the world, and our hearts grow cold. You see, the Scripture tells us, said, we are betrothed to the groom. We are betrothed. That means we are engaged to the groom. So when we understand that when we flirt with sin, we're flirting with death. Let me read a scripture that's haunted me this week. 1 John 2, verse 15 to 17. It says, do not love this world. It'll be on the screen here. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. That line in verse 15, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Let me tell you, the church of this generation loves the world. 
It's infected the church greater than COVID-19. It's infected us. We say we love the Lord, but we live like we love the world. And let me tell you, the love of the world pushes out the love of the Father. The hearts of many will grow cold. And yet, I'm too quick and trite, and I think we are, to go, sheesh, but it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. Come on, let's carry on. This is the old, the old refrain, take the world but give me Jesus. There's a man in Matthew 19, the rich young ruler. He had everything the world could offer. He had wealth. He was rich. He had youth. He had authority. He was a ruler. He was everything that the, we would say is success. You've made it. You should be fulfilled. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit the kingdom, to enter your kingdom? What do I need to do? Jesus says, obey the commandments. He said, done them. Yes, 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 yes. And Jesus says, yes, you have, except for one. What was the one commandment this guy did not do? That Jesus had to push to probe his heart and said, go give everything away. Do you want it to expose the thing in his heart? But actually the reason was he was going, I'm going after the love of the world in your heart. One commandment he didn't have was love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, with a growing affection, with growing anticipation, with growing expectation, with a growing obsession. Do you love him more than the world? And it says this man went away sad because he loved the world more than he loved God. Let me say this. He wanted eternal life, but he wanted it with competing affections. You can't love the world and love God. You can't. You can't love the world and love God. So I tell us, I urge my own soul, get rid of the world. Because you see, the church is sleepwalking through life. We sleepwalking through life and we just go, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. But I want to tell you, you only realize you're dreaming when you're woken up. Too much of us have got this unreal reality of what our life is that actually it's not that bad, it's not that evil, it's not too far, it's not our life, our affections are not too, it's okay to be lukewarm because we're dreaming. And in our dream state, we start to think that is reality. Wake up, O oh sleeper. This is what reality is. Firstly, the church is asleep. Secondly, for time's sake, the this, this scripture tells us that there is a coming king, the king who is coming. It says, at midnight, they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And this is exciting. It's in a moment. I was thinking about the reality of what we have just, just glimpsed here on earth is a foretaste of glory divine. In a sense, he's just opened the door for us. And we've just, the greatest moment of God's presence in your life, the greatest understanding of his affection for you and his love for you that's taken your breath away, his greatest miracle of provision, his greatest miracle of breakthrough, of healing, is just us stepping through the front door. We don't know that actually the door is swung wide open and when the king comes, he'll say, enter into my joy. It's exciting. The trees of the field will rip themselves up and they'll clap their hands at the king coming. The mountains themselves will uproot themselves and bow down low. Every king, every queen, every president, every politician, every ideology, every philosophy, every religion, every perspective will bow down before the coming king. Let me tell you this way. Sin, no more. Sickness, no more. Tears, no more. Loneliness, no more. Rejection, no more. Heartache, no more. And the world and its pleasures will grow strangely dim. As we just see him, 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 him. He's come back. It's him. And we'll realize the, the, the result of our affection, our, our expectation, our anticipation, our obsession. But again, a lot of us will hear that and we go, he's coming back. The king is coming back. Go, ah, not the end of the world. Then let me tell you, it's exciting. The king is coming back. Or oh, it's terrifying. There's no neutral ground here. You see, I, I, I at the back have a countdown clock. And let me tell you, I've gone way over my time already. It says zero. That means I've got no time left. But often I have this imagination that this countdown clock, this counting down the time left to the end of the sermon, that's the, imagine if that's the countdown to him coming back. And I have this fear in my heart, if I'm being very honest with you this morning, 
Because I see this countdown, we, we know actually we've got less time, less time. He's coming back, he's coming back. We, are we ready? Are we ready for his return? And we just stay unchanged, we stay unbothered, we stay lukewarm, we stay cold, and we go, it's not the end of the world. That's for this, don't get too much in, up in my grill, man. You're passionate, I love your passion. It's not the end of the world. And I've got this fear that many of us, that people would die and we'll get to heaven one day and now this is just a thought and we'll find the door is locked towards us. And my fear is that this, that God will, you'll, people will say, but I was at Life Changes for 10 years. I was in Gabe's church and he told me, just put your hand up and say a prayer and you're in. I did that. And Jesus said, I didn't know you. It keeps me up. It shakes me to the core. You see, I think the reality we have to understand is that the church and myself, deeply entrenched in myself, the love of the world that needs to come out, is that I think that all of this is actually a setup for me. I think that we often think that. We all are the, the, the heroes of our own story. And, 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 the, and Jesus is he's for us. Yay! For me! And we love that scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Let me tell you, this is how I better read it. For I, God, knows the plans I have for you. He has plans for you. His plans to prosper us, not harm us, give a hope in the future. But they're His plans, not ours. And even the way we read scripture, for generations we have taught people, and I am the first one to apologize about this. I've taught people, this is how you read the Bible. First thing you do is open the Bible, read a scripture and say, what does it mean to you? It's wrong. The first thing we should do when we read scripture is saying, what does it mean? Not to me and my preference, what I think it should say. That's where we've got wrong. What does it mean to me? Well, it doesn't. You know what? It can't really, I don't want it to touch that idol of my life. I don't want that scripture to do that. So, And we find we get cold. Why are my affections, why are my anticipation, my expectation, my obsession for Jesus growing dimmer? Scripture doesn't bend to us. We bend to Scripture. I say to you, what is God's will for your life? What is God's will for your life? I'll help clear that up right now. Thank you for asking. He's not trying to make you rich. It's not even on his agenda. He is not trying to make you famous. But I want to have a platform to give God glory. He doesn't need your platform. He has already got all glory, honor, and power. He's not trying to give you earthly power. If you want to know what God is doing, Romans 8 verse 28 tells us, yes, all things work together for the good of those who love God, but keep reading. Verse 29 says, so that we would be conformed to the image of His Son. God's will for your life is to conform you to the image of His Son. God's will for your life this year is to make you more like Jesus. Five, God's five-year plan. God, what's your five-year plan for me? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Make you more like Jesus. 10 years, make you more like Jesus. 15 years, make you more like Jesus. He's preparing a bride for a groom. That is what he is doing. So I ask us as we land, maybe I can ask Bunty and the team to come up to help us land this. Are your affections, your expectations, your anticipation, your obsession growing more and more or less and less? And I pray that question does not meet with a lukewarm, cold, apathetic response in your heart saying it's not the end of the world. Because that scripture ends with this verse that I actually don't know what to do with. It says this, the five were ready. The five who didn't have oil went to go buy oil and they came back and they knocked at the door and, says, Lord, and they said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. The kingdom of God, like a bride and 10 bridesmaids who are waiting for a groom. Let me tell you, my last story is in our terrible sleeping of the last week, we've got another child, Benjamin, who is thunder and lightning during the day and yet is an angelic angel at night. From eight to eight, see you in the morning, Benji. Except for one night this week, when about four in the morning, the darkness, darkest moment where you deep sleep, 
Suddenly I heard a cry, a scream, Dada! Dada! And I knew that's Benji. And I was up out of bed, I'm sprinting there, and the little man is standing in his cot and he's staring at the wall. Staring at the wall. Dada! And I'm bench, bench, bench. And I don't know what was going on. I don't know what awoke him. I don't know if some dreaming something. But I had to come settle him and put him to sleep. And my heart was racing. It's okay, my boy. Put him down. And, and as I've been percolating and thinking about this sort of reality, in the middle of this narrative, we're told there is a midnight cry saying the groom is coming. But here's the great news as I read Scripture, is that we find that Jesus moves towards our cry. He moves to our cry. Maybe you're here today, and this is what I would pray, that before, almost wake up, before the cry comes, the groom is coming. I wake up right now and I release a cry to him, say, I want you, I need you. Maybe like Benji, you're not able to articulate the thing. Maybe you're facing the wall. Literally, you've hit the wall. You're financially, emotionally, relationally in your life, or maybe everything is good on the outside, but internally you're crumbling. You've hit the wall. Cry out to him. He says, I hear your cry and answer. When you call on my name, I will answer you because here is the great news for you let me tell you about Jesus the scripture tells me that his affection his anticipation his expectation his obsession is us it says he ever lives to pray for us his eyes have never left us he's our right uh, he's at the right hand of the father and he is our man in glory presiding on our behalf pleading on our behalf and he is coming back for us he loves us and He wants us. And here's the good news that I started. He has paid the price. The bridal price was paid on the Calvary. He sat with the Father and He drank the cup to ratify this covenant. The great news as He said this in John 14, I have gone to prepare a place for you. I'm going ahead and we're in my Father's house. There are many rooms. And He says, I will come and get you so that you'll always be where I am. Let me tell you, the price was so much. We have no doubt that He is coming back for us. But here's my question. If you want to enter into his world, it demands the end of your world. It's the end of the world. What an amazing word. We hope you enjoyed that sermon. If you would like to find out more about Life Changes Church, why don't you go onto our website or you can follow us on our social media. Have an amazing, amazing week.